We are on Davchaf Hey Amud Aleph. If you're following an art scroll, we are on 25A1. <clears throat> so we were learning about Rabbi Hanina Mendoza um, and his wife and how they were, uh, they were a, 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 a couple, if you will, that uh, lived a life of Nisim. And his connection, and especially his power for tefillah, was extraordinarily, uh, pa- was extraordinarily powerful. To the point where a word from Rabbi Chinea Mendoza and HaKadosh Baruch Hu was uh, all, all over it. <clears throat> now, we carry on, because we're dealing with many of the stories that, uh, that are relevant to him, to his family. Amr Divitayu, his wife, said to him, Ad emat Until how long are we going to be suffering? With they were very, very poor. Amar la, Amar What do you want us to do? Bay rachami, dinitvu lachmidi. He said, "What do you mean? <laughs> you pray for everybody. You pray for everything. You get answered. So pray." Bay rachami, and dinitvu lachmidi. You should get something. Bay rachami. So he prayed. Yatzeta kemin pisat yad. Uh, something that looked like a hand, okay, came out from uh, from Shamaim. Viahavule chad kara de pitora de dahava, and the hand was holding a one leg, if you will, of a table that was made out of solid gold. So he's got a solid gold leg of a table. Chazai bechelma, he saw in a dream. In the world to come, the, the righteous will be eating at the tables of gold. They're sitting at a table that has three golden legs. Everybody else. But you, you and I, are sitting at a table that only has two. Amra le, she said, Nichalach de Mechil, Achli Kule Alma Apator de Mishlam. Is that you happy that everyone should be eating at a, a table that uh, that's complete that will that works? The Anana Apator de Mechdemachaser, and we should be eating at a table um, that's missing, right? Is he right? Amra Amra le, she said, Umay Navid. So what are we supposed to do then? I agree with you, she says. I don't want to be, uh, you know, singled out in Gan Eden for having less. I agree with you, but what should we do? <clears throat> she says, pray to God and let them take it back from you. <clears throat> he prayed and they took this, this golden leg back uh, from him. Tana. <clears throat> Greater was the second miracle that it took, got taken back from the first miracle that it was given. Digmiri. Demehev yahave. Heaven gives. Mishka lo shakali. But it doesn't take back. Like we saw already a few times after it started raining, they said, Tell, pray it should stop raining. Same concept. From heaven they gave the beracha. You can't reject that beracha. You can't turn it back. Now, obviously, just to point this out, this does not mean that there are gold tables in Gan Eden. But if that's the case, so then what does it mean that they were given one of the legs of their table in Gan Eden? So I want to share with you a very powerful idea. <coughs> the Maharal explains that the spiritual world and the physical world interface. Okay? And where the spiritual world and the physical world interface, spiritual things are given what's called a levush, an article of clothing. We talked last week about how when God wants someone to feel better, so there's an angel called Raphael. We talked about that last week, remember? But as an example, when a person says that they saw an angel, and the angel has wings, what does that mean? It's just God wanting the guy to get better. The Maharal explains that a spiritual desire in Shamayim consists only of what Hashem wants or doesn't want. 
But as it interfaces with our world, which is extremely physical, that desire takes on a more and more and more physical form as it comes closer from God's world to ours. To the point where you could have Eliyahu Anavi appearing to people as a regular human being. Because God's desire manifested in this world might look like a regular guy walking up to you saying, I need tzedakah. And that's Eliyahu Anavi. It's not that Eliyahu Anavi has this trunk of disguises. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. I haven't used this one in a while. Right? The mustache with the fake glasses. No. It's a spiritual, a physical dressing up, if you will, of a spiritual idea. And there's many examples of this concept. How... We talk about the rain being a sign of biracha, even though maybe my business has nothing to do with rain, but the expression that from Shamaim something is raining down on me is the manifestation of a spiritual desire to give to Am Yisrael. Is that clear? If it's raining with a tremendous ferocity, even if nothing happens, it, it's representative of a spiritual anger, if you will, of a, of a discontent from Hashem in the way we're doing things. So what is true in a completely uh, physical, is in a completely spiritual state in Gan Eden, there isn't any physicality to Gan Eden whatsoever. So how do you have a table with a gold egg? The answer is you don't. But the position, uh, the kavod, the reverence that the person enjoys after having lived a life of such, uh, of such piousness, it is as if someone is sitting at a table which is made out of gold and taking from your portion in Gan Eden is as if, right? That has to be manifested here in this world. So that's what happens. In fact, um, we learn the idea. It says, Befroach Reshaim Kimo Esev. person doesn't understand what's going on. Sadiq, the Sadiqim, they have difficult. Guy is praying every day, learning all the time, there's no money. This guy, Rasha Merusha, does everything wrong in his life and he's rolling in the cash. How could that be? So every Friday night, what do we say? You see the Rashaim, they're flourishing like crabgrass. They don't need any tending to, they don't need any pruning. Mm -hmm. How could that be? Says the Pasuk. So that for eternity, whatever sakhar they had in the next world will be used up here. And then they go to, Gan, to, to, to the higher world. There's no Gan Eden for them. It's directly to Gainam. So you see that Rasha can be paid his Gan Eden in this world. What is the currency for that? The answer is we manifest what that idea would be in a spiritual sense into the physical world, and a person can actually use that up. Wild. Okay. So can I ask a question? Sure. What then, the manifestation of what, what, represented that table with two legs because it seems incomplete. It doesn't seem like a beracha. No, that's exactly the point. That mina shamayim, we wanted you to be have minimal here so that everything is reserved for there. You it. want to take from there, no problem, but then you're taking away from the completeness of what you have there. Okay. I think it's also interesting, by the way, because if this whole thing is really a mashal, this leg is a mashal personified. Right? right? Given physical form. Why didn't it say everyone else at a table with four legs? It said three. It said three. Why didn't it go from four to three? You know what the answer is? Because a table with three legs out of four still stands. A table with three legs, that go down to two, two legs, the whole table collapses. Wow. Yeah? What HaKadosh Baruch Hu was saying, in a sense, to Rabbi Hanina Mendoza and his wife was really more than just with this vision of his, in his dream, was more than just, don't take this, this is gonna ruin your table. You're not gonna be able to put your coffee on something, right? But rather, what I think what he was saying is, is that the whole table collapses when people try and take from their portion in the next world, in this world. Because that is the difference between a rasha and a tzaddik. A rasha lives for this world. A tzaddik lives for, do the right thing now, it'll come back to me later. So he's expressing to her that the whole table, so to speak, the whole structure collapses if you're borrowing against your future in Olam Abba. Okay, let's carry on. <clears throat> the Gemara now continues. Chad be Shimshe. One week, be Shimshe, which is like ben Hashimashot, 
Chaziel Ba'ate Dahave Atzivat. He saw that his daughter was very sad. Amar la biti. He says, my daughter, why are you so sad? What's the problem? She said, Amar le klisha chometz netchalif li b'klisha shemen. I had a vessel of vinegar, okay, uh, uh, a pitcher. It got switched for a container of oil, okay. Vidlakti mi menu or le Shabbat, and I put it into the uh, into the the candles for Shabbat. And now that's obviously not going to light because it's vinegar. It was the wrong one instead of uh, the oil. Amala, he said, Biti, my ichpitlach. What do you care? Misha amar leshemen v'yidlok. The person that told oil to burn, who you amar lechometz v'yidlok. He can also decide that this week vinegar will burn. Tana, we learned, haya dolek v'holech kol hayom kulo. Not only did it burn like the properties of oil, which is combustible, which is uh, flammable, if you will, it burned the entirety of Shabbat, and they were able to even take Havdalah um, from what's it called? From it. Now, the question is I have a couple questions. Number one, question number one. What's my first question? And it's vinegar burn? No, that's not my question. How do you get golden legs coming out of the sky? All this is, they were, is complete open miracles that Rabbi Hanina Mendoza was used to. They have no food. The neighbor comes over. She gets embarrassed. She goes into the back room to get the, to get the, uh, uh, the, shovel. the shovel, not the shovel. What's the yeah, item the that the guy gets for the, for the Peel. pizza? Peel. Is that what it's called? No, of course he knows. Should we rely only on the miracle? A baker N- shovel. No, it's, yeah, that's what they, huh? Two people who have pizza ovens tell us it's called peel. I, it's called I, a pizza peel. I believe, okay. Okay? So the item that you get out, that you scoop out all the bread, right? That you cut, take it out. She already knows, because she's been seen, she already knows the miracle is going to happen. I have two questions on this. Anyone want to suggest? Why does she just use oil? Number one, why does she just use oil? She said she made a mistake. She made a mistake. Okay, so, so get go get some oil, switch it. Maybe the time was too late. Okay, time was too late. Maybe that's one position. Good. What else? What other questions we have on this story? You can't use the Shabbat light to light up the last candle. Well, they, they took, that's why they took f- a flame it. from that and made it on something else. So you can't touch the flame for the Shabbat candles. Isn't it Shabbat is over? Why? Oh. Huh? Shabbat is over. Shabbat, what? Shabbat's already over. Why can't you use that? Why can't you light it to a... Okay. Is the expectation of a miracle not right? Okay, question. So good question. First question is um, the expectation. Now, normally, we have this idea that a person in somchin al you don't rely on a miracle. So in a scenario where God does a miracle or God has to do a miracle, you believe that Hashem can do a miracle. But here, it's unnecessary. It's, it's unnecessary. Why? It's an unnecessary, unnecessary miracle. Go get the oil. Just go get, go get the oil. oil. Oh, okay. Somebody else light it. What else? One other item. Hashem does a miracle. What's the miracle? That the vinegar burns. Why does the vinegar have to burn longer than the oil burns? It's enough that you made, it, made me a miracle that the vinegar should burn like oil. Why the oil, the vinegar have to burn till the end of Shabbat, where the oil doesn't do? Good question. That is a good question. question. Not only that, not only that, like the end of the story seems, now that the vinegar burned, now that the vinegar burned till the end of Shabbat, do you need to tell me that they took the Havdalah light from that? Who cares? Who cares if they lit it? So just tell me, it went to the end of Shabbat. Why is it relevant that they lit the Havdalah candle from it? Like if you told me that it went till the end of Shabbat, You told me. Okay, Okay, so for, for one minute about the next. I'd like to suggest something that's 
that's being communicated here that oftentimes maybe we miss if you're not paying attention. There's a reason why I had to go to Havdalah. What is Havdalah? What do we say in Havdalah? Mavdil ben Kodesh lechol. God is the one that separates between Kodesh and Chol. God is the one that separates between Or and Choshech. God is the one that separates between Yom Hashvish Hashem Ha'aseh. God is the one that separates between Yisrael Amim. That's up to God. What the Gemara is telling us is exactly the phrase that Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa said to his daughter. Who decides that oil lights? God decides. God's the one that divides, that decides between light and dark. So an expression of what happened was Havdalah. You understand? That it is up to God, Hamavdil ben or lechoshech. So you're worried that it's going to be dark. That's up to God. The emunah of Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa was in effect, it was an expression of Havdalah. So what did the candle do? The candle burned to the point where they could get the light of Havdalah from it. It, it was the thing that animated Havdalah, that, that God is the one that decides between, between light and dark. Now I want to point out, there's something else that you guys missed here. It's something that keeps coming up. Benefit from a miracle. Good, that come, that's definitely true. Yeah? But you see that Rabbi Hanina Mendoza wasn't worried about that, right? Remember with the, with the story of the, bre- of the bread? It, it, it seems like he keeps deferring to his family. Why are you worried about all these things? So, so dig under that because you're almost there. Have faith in Hashem that good things are going to happen? Uh, I don't know. Yes. They had a match, let's say, or a flint. They had matches? They had flint stones to strike. My friends, again and again and again, we keep coming across this. Where something is not done, and something would not get done. But for? But for what? Pray to Hashem. No. (laughs) By Rachami, he prayed. And he was not answered. The wife. uh... And then what? The Bushah. And then he felt terrible. Yes. Nailed it. He was humiliated. Chalash date, and the rain comes. Look carefully. Yeah. God doesn't fill the oven with bread. Doesn't. Until the neighbor comes over, and now she's embarrassed, and now she goes to get the baker shovel. That means that she wasn't getting the baker shovel before. The vinegar doesn't just light until the daughter's upset. They have it at siva until she's sad. Until she's upset. In each one of these scenarios, it's almost as if God is saying, if you're not bothered, I'm not bothered. The opportunity, when I'm sad. The opportunity comes when the person feels the depth of that emotion, the feeling like, oi, this is not the way it's supposed to be. That emotion is something that's very powerful. Like the Pasuk says, Lev nishbar vinitke. Elohim lo tivzeh. A heart which is broken, nishbar, vinitke, and which is sad, Elohim lo tivzeh. God does not uh, turn away. God does not embarrass. So they may have had all the best prayers in their mind. They may have had tremendous zechut, but their heart wasn't yet broken. What was it that broke their heart? The fact that they prayed and weren't answered. They were embarrassed. That embarrassment that upset, this sadness, that causes that HaKadosh Baruch Hu looks and notices and responds to it. If you remember on Yom Kippur, we pointed out that if the, after each and every one of the, uh, of the Yud Gimel Bidot, we say, Ki bayom hazeh yichaper alechem. Ki bayom hazeh yichaper, says the, say the Sfarim, is the Rashi Tevot Bechiyah, crying. Ki, chaf, bayom, bet, haze, yehei, yichape, yud, pichia. Because you could, you could say the yud gimu midot. You could merit teshuvah. But if it doesn't bother you, if you're not upset, then the heart is not in a place where HaKadosh Baruch Hu is tuned in and willing to answer you even if you don't deserve it. Okay? So again, we see the power of emotion 
in prayer. Okay? Let's move on. Rabbi Chanina ben Dosa. Havile Hanach Izi. He had goats. Amri, Amrule, they said, Kamaf Sedan, your goats are ruining our crops. Oh, well, he said to them, Ika sedan. If you think that uh, my goats are ruining, are the ones that are ruining your fields, Nechlinu dubi. Let the bears eat them. Ve'ilo, but if they are not uh, destroying the fields, Kol chada v'chada, each one of them, Teti le'urta duba bekarnayu. Let them bring back bears bekarnayu with their, with their, on their horns, from Keren. Leurta that night, Aiti kochada vechada duba bekarnayu. You read this Gemara, it's like ridiculous. But this is the life of Rav Chanin ben Dosa. <laughs> and he specifically chose something that was out, like outstandingly insane. Yeah. We're supposed to read this and understand this today as, I mean, we're not on a level where we can sort of experience things like this, but. Unique. You're supposed to believe this to be face value, or is it supposed to be... So if you ask me this question about anyone but Rebbe Chirina Ben Dosa, <laughs> I'll be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it means this, it means that, maybe, you know. Rebbe Chirina Ben Dosa, we see, again, the, the point of the Gemara is the ridiculousness of the Nisim that happened with him. Right? Now, by the way, this is a funny thing, but there are many examples of like crazy things happening, ironically, almost always by Moroccans. We talked before about this with dreams with Moroccans. These Moroccan like grandmas, it's not normal. Really, they dream about things like prophecies of the future. It's not, and it's like a regular thing for them. I had this dream, yeah, yeah I'm, why are you worried about it? It's just a dream, because the last 15 dreams came true. Like it's wild, the stuff that goes on, there's a connection there. And also the same thing is true with the Nisim that you experience. Our rabbis tell us that the miracles that a person experiences in their life are directly in proportion to the level of emunah. When you have someone like Rabbi Hanina Mendoza who doesn't even understand why his daughter is upset, like what's the problem? Of course the vinegar is going to light. He didn't ask God for the vinegar to light. It was simple by him that, like obviously, what's the difference? It makes no difference. This is where, like, we're in the matrix over here. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any difference. It's pure emet. The level of emunah that a person has, um, it institutes the level of open miracles and how counter to nature those things can be. I just want to share with you, I have a, a dear friend, uh, Miguel Abadi. Um, he went on a trip to Morocco. He's a skeptical guy. He's not a cynical guy. He's not like a, you know... He went on a trip to Morocco with Rabbi Pinto. And they went to visit, I think, the, the kever of Rabbi Pinto, Rabbi David Pinto's great-great-grandfather, Rabbi Chaim Pinto, outside Esawera. Okay? And they're walking down the road, and this dog, this little dog, runs out and starts yapping at them, barking, running around. The rabbi looks at the dog. My friend said, I saw this with my own eyes. He says to the dog, mechulim lachem, mechulim lachem. You're forgiven, you're forgiven, you're forgiven. The dog rolled over on its back, and it died. <laughs> this is my friend he's like he's like I don't know I don't believe in stuff he goes but I saw with my own eyes <laughs> so this, there are these experiences like you know this is not a hundred years ago this is my friend from London like you know this happened when I lived right when I lived there it's like <laughs> it's not a sketch it's not a sketch you know this you, there are wild and crazy things that you know you experience with, you gr- with, with great chachamim I attribute it to the fact that deep down we believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu split the sea and that he turned water to blood and that there's frogs in Egypt. How do you believe in those miracles? And not now. The answer is that Hashem doesn't do them now. Okay, but every once in a while, for whatever reason God decides to do them, he does them. So the question is not, we sh- our question should not be the incredulity that we have, how could that have happened? The question we should have is that how come God decided to, to have this aberrative behavior which he normally doesn't have? Our question should be why did God choose now? Not I can't believe this happened. How did this happen? For us, we know that, you know, I mean, again, I, I, I point this out all the time. You're having trouble in business and what's a Jew's response? Walk six blocks the other way from his business. Don't go to work. 
Go to the, the pshul, open up the aron, and in front of scrolls with letters on them, you know, say to Hashem, you need money. Like, we're crazy in the eyes of the world. Our emunah is nuts. We believe in this anyway, but sometimes when something is so extraordinary, we think to ourselves, ah, how could that be? But really, there's no difference in this extraordinary thing and in this extraordinary thing. That words coming out of your mouth from a book should influence a deal that you have with some non-Jewish guy later this afternoon is as miraculous as any of the things that we're talking about. Can I ask a question? Yeah. You know, to Harry's point, whether something is literal or allegorical, the girl was pouring vinegar versus oil. The consistency, the viscosity of oil is much different than vinegar. Yes. You pour vinegar, you know it's not oil. So, doesn't make sense to me. What doesn't she make sense? Is she pouring two candles or one? Two, right? You mean, why, you mean how did she, she make the mistake? One and she said, God bless you. I could tell you've never got ready for Shabbat in your life. <laughs> Does it make sense to me? I'm just saying, I'm going to say that again. In the same container. I, I could tell that you never got ready for Shabbat in your life. Because when you're in Shabbat, you could stick the challahs instead of into the oven, into the cabinet. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're flying around, you know yeah. what's going on. Yeah. It happens all the time. She got upset, okay. no. She got upset that she realized when it's happened. She really, she, it wasn't when she was trying to it light it. Twice. Okay. You, yeah, but you're, you're there, it's the baby's so pulling on you. Because Someone's telling you, take the challah out of it. <laughs> I've done things far, far more ridiculous. Yeah. I'm, sometimes I'm running around Erev Shabbat with the keys to the car in my hand, yelling, where are the keys? Where are the keys? I need to go, it's late. That pressure, Erev Shabbat, yes. when everything, you, you're an idiot. What do you mean? It's in your hands. But, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you know, you're not, that's, I, you know, that's not uh, to me. Okay, Rabbi, let's. I have a quick question. Yeah. So, the oral tradition was passed down from Hashem to Moshe on Har Sinai? Yes. And this is what Hashem told Moshe? Like these stories? No, 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 no. These, that happens much later. The oral tradition that Hashem says to Moshe are the explanations of the various elements of the Mishnayot, of the Halachot, uh, many of the, let's say, perhaps the lessons of the Agadot. So the lessons themselves, all of that was part of this uh, corpus of, of, the, of the oral law. Talmud goes into that. Yes, gotcha. yes. Okay. Gotcha. And now these stories are stories that took place in their time. Now again, remember, what, there's a big machloket as to how, did you, how do you decide which Gemarot are allegorical or not. So there's a famous Shiltei Giburim in a Masechet Abu Dazara. And Shiltei Giburim says, if you want to look it up, it's very interesting. I don't know if, if your Hebrew is good. It's on page, in the back of the reef, it's on page 7. So the Gemara, it's very small letters on the side. You see Shiltei Giburim. He asks this question, how do you decide when a Gemara is allegorical, when it's, when it's practical? So his ruling is, what he says is, that if something is like so far beyond impossible, that it's, not impo it's an impossible thing, then you should understand that that thing is, the Gemara is trying to teach you a lesson. And that's what the Gemara is, that's what the Gemara is trying to say, okay? But what the Shilteki Borim is actually telling you is that what you're supposed to do is recognize that there are miracles. And if there are miracles, then how could that be the barometer if something's impossible? Right, because if you believe that there's miracles, then that's impossible, so then that's an allegory. The answer is sometimes seen from the context of the story. In other words, what is the, what is the Gemara trying to tell you? Here it's trying to say that Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa lived the life of insane miracles. So the insane miracles that it then gives you are a proof of that said concept. So here is something that you would you'd be more likely to understand is exactly what the Gemara, the, what it says is, you know, it says what it says on the tin. In a regular scenario, you read something about a rabbi who was juggling goats, and that's not the point of the Gemara. So if you understand that the Gemara is trying to communicate a lesson to you, okay? Havale ahu shivata, he had a, a neighbor, de kabanya beta, velo matu kishure. He had a neighbor that had uh, the, he had a, who had a house, and the beams of the house, lo matu, they did not reach. Okay, one side to the other. Atelekame, she came to him. Amrale, she said, Baniti ba'it beti velo kamtu kshurai. I built this house now. I got the guy. What's it called to come and build it? But the beams that we put them in, they don't reach from side to side. Can't support the house. Amrale mashemech. He said, What is your name? Amrale Aiku. She said, My name is Aiku. Amar Aiku nimtu kshurai. Aiku, let your beams reach. By the way, this Rebbe Khanim Mendoza 
If he would have opened up a construction company, Shema Yisrael, he would have cleaned up. Higiu ad Tana, Higiu ad Shiatsu Amalekan ve Amalekan. The beams extended until they were Amalekan, Amalekan, Ama outside of each side of the wall. Yesh Omrim, and some people say, Snifin Asaum. It's not that they extended an Ama out, but rather they, uh, they, they, they was like almost like an added piece was added on the end, but miraculously. No, so it doesn't sound like the Gemara is asking, is telling you that there's a difference between the first one and the second one, but rather it's actually physically expressing to you how did this miracle occur? Did it occur that it just extended and grew? Or did another section, so to speak, attach itself to the end of the thing? Now to me, again, this Gemara right here reinforces that this is not allegorical. Because look, the Gemara is trying to figure out which way did the miracle, either way it's miraculous. Did it happen because it extended? Or did it happen because extra sections seem to be, you know, added to the, to the, to the end? Tanya, the bright that says, I always wondered, by the way, when I read this Gemara, I wonder if this lady was the same lady as the first lady. And we had the first lady, the troublemaker, who came into the house, she sees the smoke, the, she sees the smoke coming up, she comes, she's like, oh, where's all the food? You better take out the bread, you know? She's, the te- she's teasing her. I wonder if this is her. The question I had was, okay, then how come it wouldn't, it's telling us the name now, why didn't it tell us the name then? What's the answer? Excellent, before was an embarrassing thing. She was being painted in a negative light, so we're not gonna share her name. But over here, maybe we'll share her name. Now, I have an additional, uh, additional concept here that I want to... In other words, earlier we, were, we read about, it says, it says um, the Gemara said, if you look back, the Gemara said, right, he, he had uh, every day, right, sorry, every Friday, she would leave the oven running because she was embarrassed, okay? She had, she had a bad neighbor, Okay? And the bad neighbor exposed, tried exposing her poverty. And in the end, what happened? Uh, Hashem did a miracle for her. Now we read about this other neighbor, but it doesn't tell us if this is the same neighbor that we discussed earlier. So I said, if it's the same neighbor, why would it tell us her name now and not tell us her name then? Right? So Jonah answered, sorry, yeah? No, does it say anywhere in the... In the uh explanations that, you know, what her name was or not? The first time, no. The first time it doesn't say. The second time it does. No, and any, the Rashi or the uncle, all this stuff, they don't, you know. In, in, you're asking in the first Gemara. No, in the second one, does it say, like, Iku was the same one as the first one? Not that I know of. One second. I'll look again to see if any of the, the commentaries say it on the side. I don't see that anybody says it. Okay, okay ready? So I wanted to just share one, uh, one piece here. Um, I'd like to suggest that it's the same neighbor. Ready for this? Well, what's, why was that based on? There's another time where we come across the concept of the beam of a house. Anyone remember where we have experienced this concept of the beam of a house? It wasn't strong enough? Sorry, I don't hear what you're saying. The walls were falling down where the rabbi was underneath it and he didn't want to walk underneath the walls of the house? It doesn't talk about the beams of the, of the house, does it? Amata Binyan. I don't know if we spoke, spoke about it. We come across Amata Binyan in a, in a very strange Gemara. The Gemara tells us 
that a certain convert came to Hillel and, Shem, Hillel and Shammai. First he goes to Shammai and he says, Gaireni, convert me, al minat, in order, right, on the condition that you teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot. What does Shammai say? Nothing. Dechafo, he pushed him, be'amat ha'binyan, with the beam of the house. Comes Hillel, the guy comes to Hillel, same thing. He says, convert me on the condition you can teach me all the Torah on one leg. Yeah? What does he say? No, that's not what he says. Very close. He says, the Allah sani al ta'avid. What you hate, don't do to someone else. That's what he says there. Right? That's what he says to the, excuse me, to the convert. The Gemara, the commentaries explained that, we, that what Hillel was basing it on was But he doesn't say that to him. He says actually to him, that which you hate, don't do, don't do to your friend. Okay? That's how he expressed. He says everything else is dependent on this only. If you got this, you'll learn everything else. Idach pirusha, everything else is explanation beyond this principle. Zil gimor, go and study it. Okay? Why was Shammai pushing him away with the Amata Binyan? And why was Hillel saying that the root of all Torah is after Yach What was What was the convert really asking? Convert me on one leg. To yeah. Me. What do you got? Jonah, what do we got? Yes. I literally just read this last night. It said that when Shammai was stern, he wanted to banish them from the world to come. But Hillel, he was humble to bring them close under Hashem. So Shammai was pushing them away for later, and Hillel was bringing them close for now. But why Amat HaBinyan? Why doesn't he use his hands? Why does he, why does he, he needs a prop? Right, Takes the, be, the beam from the building. <laughs> does he feel the guy's going to... Contaminate him? So he, so he doesn't want to touch him. I don't know. He doesn't want to touch him. So I think that there's something here which is, uh, which is very powerful. What Shammai is telling uh, this convert is you're asking, yeah, you're asking for what's it called? To come to come on the Takat Kanfer Shekhina. And you want me to teach it all to you with, on one leg. What Shammai communicates to the Ger is he says to this convert, how can I do that? The, the process of learning Torah, it's a, it's a structure. Imagine trying to build a house with a short be'amata. He didn't push him away with the stick, the beam of the house. He said to him, you could imagine trying to build a structure with a beam that's too small, it's too short. It's not going to work. Dechafo be'amata binyan says to Hillel to him, he says, the truth is, if you have this principle, idach pirusha, zil gemor, everything else will grow out of that. It's enough to sustain the building. If you could put someone in front of yourself, you could be other focused, you're not focusing on yourself, all the mitzvot could come out of that. The neighbor comes to uh, Rabbi Hanina Mendoza. Why didn't she go to a stinking contractor? My beams are too short. What is she saying? She's now asking forgiveness for the first story. She says to Rabbi Hanina Mendoza, my beams are too short. My house is going to collapse. My religion, my structure, my Jewish home. I came to try and find your wife to, to out her and her poverty. It's not enough. Amata binyan, that's my, that was my chidush on this Gemara. So what does the rabbi tell her? He says to her, Eku, right? What's your name? She says, Eku, right? Um, Why would he ask that question? Sorry? He knows her. He, he knows her. But what is he saying? Nim let, uh, let the kishuraich, let the beams uh, extend, okay? Um, and the Gemara is telling us something very, very powerful here. He says, who are you? What's your name, Eku? She says, my name is Eku. So he says, Eku, nimtu When a person 
um, when a person is born in this world, right, every person gets a name. And we know already that the name of a person indicates the essence of that person. So she came to him and said, look, I've fallen short. So he asks her, what's your name? What's your purpose? What'd you come here for? Right, she says, my name is Eku. She says, okay, if that's the case, you have a tachlit, you have a purpose, you have a koach in this world. Nim tu kishuraich. Let, you could stretch, you could become more. You're telling me that you fell short, no problem. So build the person. And that's why the Gemara goes to the, diff- to the difficulty of communicating that he's talking to her about her name, about herself. Nim tu kishuraich. And the Gemara asks and says, well, how did he suggest that she should grow? The first opinion says that it's just an expansion of the person's self. The second opinion says, no, you take new pieces, you learn something new, and you add it into the person that you are. So the Gemara is asking about how does that growth process take, uh, take place. But you, I know we were talking about these ideas in their metaphorical and their allegorical explanations, but I just wanted to share with you one of my, uh, my chidushim that I understood this Gemara. Okay, Tanya, the Gemara says, Palimo Amar. Palimo used to say, Ani ra'iti oto abayit. I saw the house. Vayu korotav yotzot amad lekan ve'amalekan. I saw that the beams extended amalekan ve'amalekan. Okay? On, on each side, they had an, an extra, an extra ama. Right? Ve'amruli. And they said to me, Bayit ze shekira. This house was the house that, that Rabbi Hanina Mendoza covered with his prayer, with his tefillah. Because he prayed that uh, the beam should support the roof. So you see that house with the beam sticking out on either side? Rabbi Hanina Mendoza did that with his prayer. Rabbi Gemara continues. Where do you get these goats from? We just already said 16 times that he was poor. He was so poor. We're not supposed to raise small cattle in Eretz Israel. The Gemara has a specific reason why in the time of Beit HaMikdash um, they would not raise those animals in the Beit HaMikdash. There's a, a Gemara in Ro'e Behem Adaka that talks about it. There's a Gemara that talks about the fact that, they, uh, that the damage that comes from them is very shachiach happens quite often, which is actually what happened. They said to him, your goats are grazing in our fields. They're ruining our fields. So how did he do it if he was a tamich hakam? He surely would have followed the halakha. Amar Pinchas Rebichas explains, Ma'asev avarad amechad el petach beto. A person passed by the house of Rebichanina. Ve'niach sham tanegolim. And he left some chickens over there. Okay? Mitza'an, mitza'atan, ishto shor Rebichanim ben dosa. Rebichanim ben dosa found this man's chickens. Ve'amar le and uh, he said to her, "Al tochlim betzehen, don't eat the eggs. Why? Because not yours. Hashavat aveda. Virubu betzim v'tane golim. There was many, many eggs, and the eggs crashed into chickens. V'havi v'ayu mitzarin otam. It came too many. While he was waiting for the guy to come back to return to him his chickens, the guy now had eggs. Eggs turned into chickens. More chickens. Okay, you can imagine they also didn't have a giant house." So there was too many. So what did he do? He sold the eggs and the chickens. Now, what did he do with the money? The Kanabidimehen Izim. He bought instead goats. Okay? With the money from the chickens and the eggs, he bought goats. Later on, that certain person passed again. He lost the chickens. I put my, t- my chickens over here back then. Shamar Khina heard him speaking. He said, Amar lo, Siman. Do you have a siman and those chickens from all that time ago? He said, yes. He gave him a valid uh, a, a, a mark that was on the chicken that illustrated, I don't know, there was a heart-shaped uh, black mark on the back of the chicken. He realized that he was his. And he gave all of the goats, the hen, hen, Isaiah, these are the goats, the Aiti Dubi Bikarnayu, that brought back these goat, these uh, bears, Bikarnayu, on their... Uh, on, on their horns. That adds another layer as well uh, to this. Because the people came and said that the goats have damaged our, uh, our fields. You have to pay us for them. But we have a principle that says, Shiluchem mitzvah and non nizakin. When a person is doing a mitzvah, they don't have damage from that mitzvah. Rabbi Chinin of knew that there was no way that his goats 
had damaged their fields because they were not his goats. These goats were the goats of a mitzvah, vashavat aveda. It can't be that they are, that they did any sort of damage that he would have to, that he would have to pay for. <clears throat> okay, now the Gemara is going to continue with another, another rabbi, and uh, we'll continue with that, Bezat Hashem, next week.